You, um, you feel good? And remarkably, the answer might actually be yes. That's the goal. You might want to live long, but even more important, you want to live well. I'd like to tell you a story about a 19-year-old sweet-natured girl named Elsa who lived in a small village in Slovakia in the heart of Europe. Elsa had an older sister who had a beautiful baby girl named Vera, who Elsa adored. One day, however, the soldiers came in and Elsa was torn away from her beloved family and taken in a cattle train to a place called Auschwitz. She was alone and scared. Elsa soon realized that Auschwitz was a place where people never left. Elsa was sorted into the line of people who were given jobs. The other people were sent to the gas chambers to die. Elsa's job was to sort through the belongings of the people who had been brought to Auschwitz. It was there that a miracle occurred. It was there that Elsa came across this photo. This is a photo of Vera. This is a photo of my mother. Elsa couldn't believe her eyes. She snatched up the photo and she smuggled it in her sparse clothes at the risk of being caught and killed. And as soon as she could, she hid that photo in the cracks in her bunk bed. And every night she would look at this photo. It was this photo that reminded her of what gave her a sense of meaning and purpose. It was this photo that gave her the strength and the courage to survive. This is the essence of resilience. Resilience is not about bad things not happening. Life is filled with adversity and challenge. Resilience is about us creating space to choose how we respond to that challenge. Are we going to be bossed around by fear or worry which is the voice of anxiety? Or are we going to be buoyant by getting in touch with our values, with what's important to us? As the brilliant psychiatrist Viktor Frankl says in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. This is the essence of my mind strength framework, which is the framework that I use to help adults, children, and teens to overcome anxiety. In the Sydney Anxiety Clinic, we work with people who experience perhaps more extreme anxiety. And in mind strength, we work in organizations and schools to help individuals to embrace resilience, mental health, and effective performance. The mind strength framework says that the situation is not always in our control, but we have the power to choose how we respond to it. We can be bossed around by fear or anger and move down these pathways, or we can realign with our values with what's important to us. So mind strength is all about standing up to fear and some of these fight or flight behaviors and embracing value-driven actions instead. So it's four steps. Recognize your fear-driven thoughts and behaviors. Clarify what gives you a sense of meaning and purpose and your values. Engage in mind strength strategies to stand up to fear and move forward in a values-driven direction. So let's explore these steps one by one. First of all, recognizing your fear-driven thoughts and behaviors. Awareness is a really important first step in overcoming anxiety because we can only change what we're aware of in the first place. So think about the last time you felt anxious. 
What was worry telling you? Typically, worry says bad things are really likely to happen. See that dog over there? That dog, that dog is definitely going to kill you. And well, those people in the corner standing there at the party, they are most certainly judging you negatively. And that maths test, not a chance of passing that one. And worry tells us the outcome is going to be a catastrophe. And there's just no way in the world you're going to be able to cope. So let's explore what happens in our brain when worry starts to boss us around. Typically, we respond to a worry thought such as, I'm going to fail this test, as if it was a real threat, such as that tiger is going to kill me. And what happens in our brain is that our prefrontal cortex which is responsible for our thoughts and our beliefs and our perception of the world, sends a message to another part of our brain, a more primitive part of our brain called the amygdala, to say that something dangerous is happening. Our brain is not so great at differentiating between a perceived threat and a real threat. And our brain then gets hijacked by our amygdala which is the control center of the fight or flight reaction. And we get this surge of adrenaline and cortisol racing through our bloodstream. And it's there to help us. It's there to protect us in the case of a real threat. But the problem is, it happens in response to perceived threat. And this is anxiety. Anxiety is our physiological reaction to threat in our environment. We get this surge of adrenaline which sets ourselves up with this physiological reaction in our mind, in our body, when there's no real danger. And so we have this excess adrenaline with nowhere to go. So a key message is that anxiety is a really important part of being human. It's not our enemy, it's actually our friend when we need it. And it is common to all of us. Hands up those of you who have experienced anxiety in your lifetime. Now, I'd be hard pressed to find a hand that didn't go up. And I might just guess that those hands that didn't go up, perhaps you're anxious about putting your hand up. So sometimes, anxiety can tip into a level that is more severe when it causes prolonged fear, suffering, and avoidance in your life. And this is when anxiety tips into becoming an anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorders are the most prevalent mental health challenge that we experience, affecting 25% of our population. And this is why I'm on a passionate mission to spread some of these messages that I'm talking about today, about the power of treatment, that you can get the help that you need. It is a treatable mental health condition. So think about the last time you felt anxious. Now, what were some of the fear-driven behaviors that perhaps took hold? Commonly, the hallmark feature of anxiety is to avoid. It's the flight in the fight or flight. But we also do lots of things to try and get certainty and control in our environment. So our fear-driven behaviors can be both mental behaviors and physical behaviors. So to give you an example of a mental behavior, there's this thing called hypervigilance to threat. And what this is, is our brain will focus in on things that we feel threatened by. So, for example, if I had a spider phobia, where would I be likely to look? I might scan the corners of the room, or I might hear the stories on the news about dreadful things that happened with spiders. Similarly, if I had social anxiety, I might be more inclined to notice the people who aren't using eye contact with me, or perhaps aren't smiling at me. And then I would interpret these more ambiguous situations in a negative way. The other feature of anxiety that commonly goes unrecognized is anger. 
Anger is so often masked anxiety. And then we have avoidance. There are many subtle ways that we can avoid. Sometimes it's overt avoiding, sometimes it's escaping, sometimes it's procrastinating, and sometimes it's using things like drugs and alcohol to numb our difficult emotions. And the most more extreme ends of the spectrum with avoidance might be self-harm, and the most extreme avoidance is suicide. So, avoidance. We stay in our nice little cozy comfort zone with our warm fluffy slippers where we'll feel safe, but we won't be living our life. Certainty and control. Human beings inherently do not like uncertainty. So if we're experiencing anxiety, we will be doing a lot of behaviors to try and get certainty. Perfectionism, checking and rechecking our work, doing what's called mind reading, which is trying to work out what somebody else is thinking about us, and lots of reassurance seeking. These are some of the behavioral features of anxiety. So the second step is we want to identify our purpose and our values. It's far easier to stand up to anxiety if we have an alternative pathway to go down. So clarity of our values is really important. I refer to the mind strength pyramid, where we want to start with the foundations, which is our values. We start with what gives us a sense of purpose. The values are our pull towards. It's commonly what's in our heart, whereas worry is commonly what's in our head, the second guessing ourselves. We want to be drawn and driven by the pull towards. Values are really individualized. Everybody has something different that gives them a sense of fulfillment, and that's okay. Individual differences are what this world is all about. And step three is we want to engage in mind strength strategies to stand up to fear. One of the strategies that I refer to is what I call the stop strategy. It's a way of getting ourselves out of the fight or flight and realigning with our value-driven pathway. It's taking some breaths, observing what's going on around us, observing which pathway we're on, and then proceeding. We want to get a bit of distance from our worry thoughts and conceptualize worry as perhaps a different entity. It's just our thoughts. And we want to replace worry with problem solving. Where worry leads to more worry, what does problem solving lead to? Solutions, absolutely. And we want to gradually approach avoided situations. We do this as if we were getting used to the water at the beach. We do it step by step. And as you know, with getting used to the water, as we do it, we get used to it. And it doesn't feel as unpleasant or as aversive until we're ready to jump right on in. We want to get out of the boxing ring with uncertainty. When we fight uncertainty to try and get certainty, we keep ourselves in the fight or flight reaction. So it's about sitting with the discomfort of uncertainty and then focusing on effort, not outcome. Effort is in our control. And finally, we want to recognize the wealth of information that talks about the mind-body connection. To look after our mind is to look after our body. Things like exercise, eating well, staying hydrated, uh, sleeping effectively. Seven to nine hours sleep is what best practice talks about. And powerful is connecting with others. We are social creatures. We crave connection. And step four, move forward in a values-driven direction. So the four steps, recognize your fear-driven thoughts and behaviors. Clarify your values. Use mind strength strategies to stand up to fear and move forward aligned to your values. So think about what value-driven actions can you do to stand up to fear and embrace well-being. Thank you.